In the beginning, there was the landscape, scenery that stirred the soul, kindled the imagination. Here on Tennessee's Cumberland Plateau, one might realize a universal dream to live the perfect life in the perfect place. This place invigorates the imagination of, of people from all over the world. During the 19th century, this land played like a siren song, luring factory workers from the Northeast, young men and families from the British Isles. They would work with Tennesseans to build a new home It is 1878 and land speculators have staked claims to thousands of acres along the new railroad line between Cincinnati and Chattanooga. Among them, industrialist Franklin W. Smith, his Boston-based Board of Aid to Land Ownership, planned to relocate unemployed factory workers from the Northeast to the fresh air and forests of Tennessee's Cumberland Plateau. Some Boston capitalists have purchased 60,000 acres of land in Tennessee and will proceed to colonize it at once with the best class of working farmers and mechanics from New England, the Nashville Rural Sun. Smith commissioned a sophisticated town plan with winding residential streets, bridle paths, and a town center. But the ambitious design might have remained only on paper. As the Northeast's economy improved, the workers returned to the factories and the Boston Board of Aid went looking for another investor. Enter Thomas Hughes. First of all, he was a famous writer. He wrote Tom Brown's School Days, a novel about life in a private uh, school for boys in England. Hughes was also an Oxford-educated lawyer and a former member of parliament. He helped found some of the very first trade unions in England, some of the first worker cooperatives, when the labor movement turned militant, Hughes took up a new cause, the plight of well-born sons like those depicted in this movie version of his best-selling novel. And don't forget, school days are your happiest days. In the Victorian era, the male children of English upper classes were educated in private boarding schools like rugby, Hughes's alma mater, and the colony's namesake. We will make a scholar of you. Upon graduation, the first-born sons of the group were groomed to take over the family assets. That was the custom by which the whole estate would go to the eldest son. The younger sons then got what they called portions, or a lump sum of money, sometimes an annuity or an allowance. When the money ran out, career choices were few. Hughes thought if these idle young men came to America, they could pursue careers as merchants or farmers without the shame usually attached to those professions in England. The idea of founding a new Garden of Eden in the unknown wilds of Tennessee will have its two attractions for them. When Mr. Hughes has got them there, they will have to work for their living. Cincinnati Dollar Weekly. It's always harder to build a community than to imagine one. We are about to open a town here to create a new center of human life, human interests, human activities in this strangely beautiful solitude. We must be careful to spoil it as little as possible. Thomas Hughes. On October 5, 1880, British and New England colonists and Appalachian farmers gathered at Rugby's brand new Tabard Inn for the opening day ceremonies. In a speech delivered from the Inn's veranda, Thomas Hughes, a staunch abolitionist, spoke of the importance of this Anglo-American endeavor in healing the wounds left by the Civil War. We know of no way in which this can be brought about better than by such efforts as this we are making, in which Englishmen and Americans can stand shoulder to shoulder and work with one mind and one heart for the same great end. I think above all he wanted a cooperative community, that is people pool their purchasing power in order to buy materials and then sell them cheaply with the profits going back to the community. That cooperative spirit would be reflected in the village commissary, where for five dollars each, colonists could purchase shares of Rugby's first general store. In this way, we shall have a common interest in the supplying of our own daily wants, and shall feel that if one member suffers, all suffer. If one rejoices, all rejoice. 
After a brief honeymoon with the press, critics soon began questioning the settlers' priorities, noting that rugby had a designated gentleman's swimming hole before it had a waterworks, a tennis court before it had pastures. But they did so, in fact, because they had nothing else to do. The titles and deeds were not perfected, so we couldn't sell them land. That meant surveyors were a common sight in the early days of the colony as the land was surveyed, then resurveyed. But in time, the skeptics proved to be right. I think the original colonists were not a good fit for this environment. They were men of education, learning, and leisure. But whether from New England or jolly old, some of the colonists handle rural living with grit and determination, sleeping three to a bed and walking seven miles for supplies. And when the worst winter in decades left the nearby Clear Fork River frozen from bank to bank, they went ice skating. The Tennessee colony is going along famously, and I think there will be a great boom for hundreds of our boys for whom there are fewer and fewer possible openings at home.